questions you want. Uh, we do have a we do have a very um, we've got a number of you know a large number of people participating. So if we do not get to each and every question, um, Karine will place our contact details on the last slide. You're very welcome to email any questions through to us at any time, and we'll do our best to get a detailed answer back to you on a same day basis and going forward as well. So welcome again. Thank you again for your time for attending. And I'm gonna hand over then to Karin to kick off with the legislative requirements that you should be aware of to undertake a solar installation if you should live in a sectional title scheme. And I think Karin, if you could just talk about freehold homeowners associations um, for those that do live in a homeowners association community scheme. So thank you, Karin, over to you. Thanks, Andrew. So basically, um, if you look at a solar installation, the first question you need to ask is who will be doing the installation? Will it be the body corporate taking it on as a project to install solar for the whole scheme? Or will it be an owner just installing solar to, to operate um, or power their section? So that will be the first question we will be looking at. If it is an owner that is doing the installation, we need to then ask where will it be installed? Because that makes a difference in the permission that is needed um, for this installation. So first of all, if it's on common property, um, you will know that the act talks about minor improvements and major improvements. I think we can all agree that a solar installation is not a minor installation. So it's not a minor improvement that the trustees can approve. It is definitely a major improvement. So if it is on common property, then that owner would technically need permission, written permission from all the other owners. Um, there is a way around that to make it easier, and that is to make that area an exclusive use area, which we will come to just now. But if it's just on straightforward common property, you will need written permission from all the owners. And there's also the possibility to then look into like a lease agreement to lease that portion of the common property um, from the body corporate. The easy way around it, because it, I know it's very difficult to get written permission from all owners, especially if it's a larger scheme, then the way around it is to make that area, make that roof space where that solar installation will be done an exclusive use area. There's different ways of making it an exclusive use area, which we're not going to go into detail here, um, but once it has been made an exclusive use area, that owner will only need an ordinary resolution. Ordinary resolution, easier to get, only the majority of owners needs to approve that installation. Then we go on to circumstances where the body corporate is doing the installation, um, taking it as a project to provide solar and power to all the units. Um, then you need to look in terms of the act if it is a necessity for that body corporate or if it's a luxury for that body corporate. Now necessity and luxury is not dependent necessarily on the cost of the project. Um, each body corporate has different circumstances and for what is a necessity for one body corporate could be a luxury for another complex. So we definitely have to look at um, the times. I'm sure we all can see that solar at the moment with the load shedding going on could definitely be argued to be a necessity. Um, but you will have to, we'll have to take it on a case by case basis. So if it's decided that it is a necessity, then there is a prescription in prescribed management rule 29 that says that the body corporate, the trustees have to send a circular to all owners to explain what they are wanting to do, what it's going to cost, how those costs are going to be paid, um, and just notifying all owners, this is what we are proposing. Should nobody object on that circular or request a meeting, then the trustees can go ahead after 30 days with that improvement. Should somebody object or not necessarily object, but ask for a meeting, then the trustees must call a meeting. And at that meeting, this resolution that would be needed for that improvement will be a special resolution. I'm also not going to go into details of what a special resolution is. Um, you will see my email address at the end of the slides. You're welcome to email me. We've got an easy guide to resolutions 
that explains exactly how every resolution works, the different types of resolutions, how to get them, um, and all of that. So you can just email me at the end. Then um, if for some reason it is decided for your specific scheme that the improvement it will be a luxurious improvement, it will be a luxury for your complex to have solar, um, for, for whatever the reasons may be, then you would need a unanimous resolution before that installation project can start, which is obviously more difficult to get. As you can hear, unanimous, all owners, more difficult to achieve. Just a couple of points to consider um, when reviewing situations or applications for solar is the ownership of the solar panel. Who will they belong to? Um, if it's on straightforward common property, it becomes the body corporate's responsibility. It becomes part of the common property. If it's an exclusive use, then it's the owner's responsibility, and that links in with the maintenance responsibility. So if, it's, if you make it exclusive use in terms of the rules, put in the rules that the owner will be responsible for maintenance to that area. Something else that needs to be taken into consideration is the structural integrity of the buildings. What is a solar panel or tin on the roof of a building going to do to the structural integrity of the buildings? Is there enough space? What is the nuisance? What negative impact could it have on values of units? Blady will touch on the insurance, but I would just like to end off to say that it's, it is good and we suggest that you have standards in your rules. Write up a couple of standards um, in your conduct rules that even though they need to get the certain permission that I just explained, that there's certain standards set out in the conduct rules. And we have colleagues, um, we've got friends like Zelinda van der at TVDM that can help you with drafting those rules. You can email me, I can put you in contact with them, but it's good to have that in place um, when you set up standards in your rules. Then just as a last slide, as Andrew promised, the link to our training, website. Um, on our website, we've got a training page. Uh, we've got different courses there available, guides, recordings. The recording of this webinar will be there as well. And then we've got the question of the week um, that we post. You'll see there are already some questions there on solar installations as well. That's it from my side. Thank you, Andrew. Andrew, you're on mute. Apologies. Karine, just, uh, just to emphasize, you know, the important point, can you go back to the um, homeowner sort of scenario? You know, let's assume you are a homeowner, we want to get solar up as soon as possible, we want to maintain our lifestyle as best we can, we're tired of being reliant on ESCOM, we'd like to save on electricity costs. I'm assuming it's faster if we approach it as a homeowner driven installation, um, because then it could be you know, under our control to arrange the contractor, we prefer the pricing, we prefer the installation, we prefer, and we don't need to be dependent on all the other owners in our complex to, to agree to the installation. So if you just go back to your slide, if you don't mind of, you know, what exactly should, should I do as a homeowner to then navigate through it? So I wanna get it up on my roof as soon as possible. You know, give me steps A, B, C to follow through to do it legally and uh, compliantly so that I've got a long-term viable solution in mind. Yes, Andrew, thanks. Yeah, unfortunately, you still need to get the, the correct permission. So it will take time. If we make it an exclusive use area, that will take time because um, you make it in the rules. The rules have to be approved by the owners. The rules have to be approved by CSOS. Only then will it be an exclusive use area and only then can you go for an ordinary resolution to, to get that in place. So unfortunately, it, it is a timeless process. The, there is no quick steps to, to get to that. But the sooner you start, obviously, the sooner you will be able to get through the steps um, of getting the, the permission in place. Um, if that answers the question, if we, if we talk about homeowners associations, that's an, obviously a whole different story. Everything that I've mentioned now pertains to sectional title schemes and the sectional title schemes management act. But in a homeowners association, the, you are governed either if it's a company, you're governed by your MOI and the Companies Act and your rules. And if it's a common law association, you will be governed by your constitution. So you will have to check what your MOI or what your constitution and all your rules say about such installations 
Um, a lot of estates, big homeowners associations have uh, um, aesthetic guidelines, building guidelines. Um, you, you can have a look at those to see what it says about something like a solar installation. But obviously, it will be easier for an owner in a homeowners association to, to put up because you don't need special resolutions and ordinary resolutions and unanimous resolutions and all of that. Um, it will be easier than for a, an owner in a sectional title scheme. Karine, is it possible to give any guidelines just in terms of timing? I know it's difficult, but if we, you know, I think the most popular or the most common scenario would be one owner driving their own installation, aiming for these panels on their roof. Um, it would make sense then for that roof area to be an exclusive use area, which would allow them to install panels on their roof. The rules ideally should make the owner responsible for maintenance of their own solar installation. Therefore, it's under their control and under their responsibility. So what average timeline do you think would be reasonable to navigate all those steps you mentioned? Three months, do you think that would be a reasonable guesstimate given that you need to give 30 days for the special me uh, general meeting to vote on the resolution, update the rules at that meeting and then lodge it with CSOS? I'm not sure about the CSOS turnaround time to approve that conduct rule amendment. Yeah, Andrew, I think three months three months is a reasonable time frame because as you said, we have to go through all that steps. And obviously for um, the complexes that we manage as Trafalgar, um, we can obviously assist them with the CSOS application to get those rules approved um, quicker. Uh, we can definitely assist with that. But yeah, I would say three months is a is a is a good estimate yeah all right so that, that's what i personally think is that sort of um, scenario is the most likely if there's obviously a groundswell of support and owners collectively in a body corporate want to go ahead with installation then the you know the collective approach might be practical and that would be a bigger installation and you know the steps kareen has outlined there as well Okay, let's move on thanks very much kareen so ed we're coming to you next so just a reminder ed is a Solar Installation Specialist, Ed is a Director of 365 Solar, and Ed's going to talk to us about, you know, what to think about from a technical and an installation scope point of view. So, Ed, thank you. Over to you. Thank you, Andrew. And thank you to the team at Trafalgar for the opportunity to share. My name's Ed Selly. Uh, I represent 365 Solar. We're a Durban-based company. And we specialize in the design, construction, and maintenance of residential, commercial, and industrial solar solutions. Karin, can we just look at the next slide? So understanding solar is sometimes a really complex field, which can be really confusing. I think getting a really basic understanding of what solar is is a good place to start with a view towards understanding that it's actually not quite as complicated as it's sometimes made out to be. A solar system consists of three major components. The panels, which during daylight hours receive sunlight and produce DC current, which is then received by the inverter, which converts it into AC current. And that current then is distributed to offset the load in the building or the property. A battery, is a large energy res reservoir. The larger the storage, the longer the backup, the more expensive it becomes. <clears throat> so the obvious question that most people pose or are considering is why should we install a solar system? The simple fact is because in varying degrees of discomfort, we don't have power. If I go back, seven, eight years, eight out of every 10 leads or phone calls that we entertained were from customers wanting to simply offset their monetary costs and save on their bottom line. Fast forward to today, 99.9% .9 of every lead we entertain is about continuity of operations in, an, in a commercial and industrial environment or continuity of lifestyle in a residential environment. And the real bonus now is the fact that over time, be it three years or be it eight years, the system will pay for itself. That is no longer the main driver. It's the bonus that just sweetens the deal and helps the decision to be made.
Can we see the next one, Kerry? Thank you. Go back one. So, I think it's back one, please. Okay. So if we can just go forward one more. Right. So now we've decided we don't have power and we need to in, we, we need to consider a solar installation. So I'm going to simplify some of the considerations and hopefully give you some guidelines to help you understand some of those aspects that would help you make a really good decision should you move forward with the solar installation. What is absolutely crucial is that we divide a solar installation into three components. The feasibility, which is all the work that goes into the upfront preparation, the installation, and what we believe is the most important is what happens after the system's been installed. So let's go to the feasibility. Critical to a successful outcome of any solar installation is the site visit. Whichever provider, installer, that you decide you want to go with must come to site. Anything between 50 and 80% of the time that we spend with our customers is dispelling the misinformation, the misunderstanding, or the confusion that, that surrounds what is available for my home. You really have three options to choose when looking at a solar installation. Option one, is a grid tied solution. That consists of panels and an inverter, and an inverter uses the grid as a reference to power up. The benefit of a grid tied system, it's the most cost effective. The disadvantage of a grid tied system is when the grid goes down, it goes down. You therefore don't have continuity. So you maximize your savings, but you don't have continuity during an outage. The other end of the scale is an off-grid system to which you add batteries. When you add batteries, you need to add more panels. The reason being, not only does an off-grid system need to provide you energy at all times, but it also needs to provide you backup energy when there's no sunlight. So the downside of an off-grid system, it's very expensive. The upside is that you are able to utilize this solution when you have no alternative energy source. In the middle, you have the sweet spot, which is called a hybrid solution. And a hybrid solution takes the best of a grid tied option and an off grid components, and it combines it into what's called a hybrid system, which is inverters, panel, and a battery array. So now that we've decided we, we need a, a hybrid system as an option in our home because it's, it can be more easily tailored to our needs, we then start drawing down to understanding the true expectations of the customer. Having put in a hybrid system, the battery component can now be downscaled to meet the budgetary expectations of the client's spend. To do this, we now need to differentiate the essential loads on the, on, the, on the client's DB board to the non-essential loads. Examples of essentials are your lights, your security, being your gates or your cameras, your TV, your Wi-Fi, and generally one major circuit in the kitchen on which is all your refrigeration, your kettle, and your microwave. That generally comprises what in most cases would be the essentials. Examples of non-essentials is your oven and hob, if it's not gas, and your geezers. Having now identified where your essentials lie, we're able to then understand the size of the battery that is required to provide you with the number of hours of autonomy to run your essentials in your home. That leads us to the physical and practical attributes of your property. How big is the roof space? Is it orientated south, north, east, or west? In homes that are orientated north are ideally situated, but we are able to use east and west facing slopes on which we can put the panels. We've now progressed through to understanding which option is best for the home, 
what we're going to power up during grid outages. And we've established that the home is now suited for the panels and the installation that meets the customer's expectations. To confirm that, we then request six months bills. On those bills are two important items. One is the kilowatt hours. That determines the load that the home is continually using over a monthly basis, and it provides us with an average basis to determine the size of the inverter that is required. The second item is the tariff. That's how much you are paying. What that assists with is your return on your investment over the period of time that you are going to have to use your system and it generate enough energy to offset your capital costs. What the kilowatt hours load together with the physical attributes enable us to do is to confirm the sizing of your inverter and the size of the system that is required. That then results in a quotation. Herein lies some of the most confusing areas for a homeowner, and that is frequently we will speak to homeowners who have got five, six or more quotes. Each one of those quotes is different because the hardware varies. Different batteries are paired with different inverters, and the combination, which everyone believes is the best option for that customer, becomes extremely confusing. How you can simplify that? Victron, Sunsync are two examples of really good brands that are in the market. And if you get your providers to standardize on the offering to you, you get a common platform to help you make your decision. That would be one of the most helpful tips that I can give you when comparing multiple quotations. Can we go to the next slide, please? So herein lies what we believe to be the most important aspect of you considering what you are going to do with your solar installation. And that is what happens after the installation is complete. If we go through the, pro, the three steps of an installation being the feasibility, normally takes a week to two weeks to get to the point of you receiving a quotation. The installation takes anywhere from two days on a small installation to four days on a three phase, slightly bigger installation. Your investment in solar is for 20 years. So in considering the real value of your investment, it lies in the continued optimal operation of your solar system. That's what maintains your continuity of your lifestyle, which today is the major driver. It pegs your energy costs at a fixed rate, being when you purchased it. And the more effectively and efficiently that your system runs over the longest period of time provides you with the best return on your investment. So when considering what you are going to do, Consider an energy partner who is going to be around with you to travel this journey. Check that they've been there for some years. And when you need help, make sure that they're available to do what needs to get done to keep you powered up. Remember, an installation is two to four days, but your system is going to last 20 years. Thank you, Andrew and team. I really appreciate the opportunity to share some practical tips with you. Thanks very much. Um, one or two questions that have come through, which might be of interest. One of them was quite interesting. What happens if you've got prepaid electricity and how do you provide the necessary um, electricity accounts for scoping and installation? So point one, there is no problem to integrate a solar system with prepaid electricity. What you do is you integrate the tying point uh, uh, below the meter. That means that you will receive the first draw of energy from the solar system before the inverter seeks an alternative source being the prepaid meter. And what that will do, it would simply mean that your prepaid amount now lasts for a great deal longer because you're not drawing all your energy from that one source. The second point with regards to electricity bills, 
You should be receiving a bill every month, be it prepaid, where you receive a receipt. And on that receipt, it tells you how much you've spent. And it also tells you how many kilowatt hours you've purchased at what rate. That can also be used as well as the actual utility bill, be it a municipal or an ESCOM bill, um, provided to us would give us what uh, we would need to do the financial feasibility. Good. Ed, why don't you speak a little bit about the maintenance of a solar installation? So it's all very well. We've talked about, you know, getting it done, what you need to think about to choose the right installation. We'll talk about cost and financing now. But what happens once it's in? You know, maintenance, monitoring, costs over the lifespan of the equipment, you know, what does the installer do or could they do to think about as part of the service level agreement? In any domestic installation, you need to have a maintenance carried out at least once a year. If you're in a rural area, as in farms or game lodges, the air is generally really, really clean and a service once a year to clean the panels, upgrade the firmware is sufficient. Should you live in a densely populated area, there is a greater level of industrial fallout, which coats the panels and reduces the efficiency. So to wash the panels two or three or four times a year helps to maintain their efficiency. What is required on an ongoing basis is upgrades to the firmware that integrates the battery and the inverter. Developers of the major brands are continually investing money in research and development that optimizes the efficiency of the inverters and creates further options for the homeowner to use on their portal. Every installation that gets carried out, the residential owner or a designated person will get access to a portal which is linked to the solar system, which enables the user at any point in time, real time, to look and change the parameters of their solar system. So it gives you helpful information of how efficient it is, how many hours it worked, how, many, how much energy it's produced and how much you've used. That portal is continually being updated as is the firmware that runs the inverter. And that needs to be updated and kept relevant pretty much like a computer needs to be done. So that kind of maintenance once a year, bringing your system up to date is, is primary and a major priority. Secondly, is that your panels need to be maintained. One of the challenges that we face, especially in rural areas, are vermin chew through cables and they cause damage. Geckos and the like love to find their way into inverters and they make a nuisance of themselves. So just general cleaning and keeping inverters in an area that is clear of uh, clutter and so on goes a long way to maintaining it as well. The third element is that this is an electrical installation. And once it has been installed, you cannot afford to have electricians or workmen subsequently working on the house and interfering with the way that the electrical reticulation has been organized when the solar installation was put in. It will cause confusion and invariably an unnecessary call out and cost to come and restore the solar system to its working condition after a contractor has been on site and has fiddled with the wrong reticulation. Normally, your uh, solar provider, give them a call, advise them what you wanna do in the house, whether it's a renovation or an extension, and they will come out and just assist in making sure that the electrician that will carry out that work won't interfere with the way that the solar system is set up and that protects the interest of the homeowner. Ed, um, is there alerts built into the firmware or the inverter where it can send a proactive alert if something's faulty or it's not working optimally, et cetera? Absolutely. The inverter's portal will automatically send you a message telling you that it is not working, that it has failed, or there, had, there has been a major incident that has shut down the inverter. It does require you to go on and look at the portal to establish what the nature of the problem is, but everybody who invests in a solar system needs to get access to the portal in order to establish and be advised of the problem. 
And maybe just to make the point, Ed, that you would need network connectivity. So the inverter would need to be connected to a network, um, a Wi-Fi network or a LAN cable to be available online to then obviously access the portal, get that information and provide the proactive alerts. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we also request to rather be hardwired rather than Wi-Fi because it's more reliable and you have a definite point of co connectivity. Most of the call outs relating to communications is on a Wi-Fi network that is not as stable as, as, as a cable. Ed, why don't you just expand a little bit on choosing a, an accredited, a qualified, a reputable contractor. You know, all contractors aren't the same. Quotes look good. You know, it's hard to judge on paper. What would you do to really understand that you are choosing qualified and accredited, a capable contractor that will support you over the lifespan of this equipment, which should be up to 20 years and more? So point number one would be to, to, to ask the contractor how long he's, he's been doing solar. And, and if I had to look at the market and break the market up, uh, three years ago, there was an estimated 1,500 solar providers and installers in the country. At the end of last year, APSA did a survey. There were 4,500. And their prediction is by the end of next year, there'll be over 9,000 installers. The problem with that is confusion and reputational damage. So first question I would ask is, how long have you been in business? And can you give us a reference of the scale and aptitude of some of the installations that you've done. And if you are a homeowner, ask for two or three references of similar installations to what you envisage putting in. The next question I would ask is, what is the standard of the, the staff complement that will do my installation? Are they wiremen, are they electricians, or are they installers? You need to have wiremen and or electricians working on your DV board in order for you to be provided with a COC after the installation. Absolutely critical. You must insist on getting a certificate of compliance with the handover of your system. That confirms that it's, it complies with law. Thanks, Ed. Last question, and then we'll move to Christian. Um, I think you did say to me that as much as the cables, et cetera, aren't, um, you know, valuable copper and, um, you know, other precious metals, you know, what is the theft risk of these um, components and what are the um, positioning implications of where the um, installation should go relative to security concerns and access control parameters, et cetera? In a domestic environment, we will always put the panels on the roof and the home is generally protected with the perimeter fence. In the 15 years that we have been installing solar, we have never experienced a customer having theft in the residential environment. What we have experienced in a commercial environment is when we ground mount large systems, we have to include in the capital expenditure some form of security fencing, and that becomes quite expensive because very often we have to electrify it as well. So in the domestic environment, We've never had cable theft, we've never had panels stolen, and we've never ever lost an inverter. Provided the perimeter protection is in place, homeowners generally don't experience risk. Okay, all right, very good, Ed. We might come back to some more questions, but if we could move along to Christian now, Christian Joubert. Christian will talk to us about financing options for solar installations. Thanks, Christian. Hi, okay, cool. Uh, Andrew, can you hear me just to confirm? Loud and clear, thank you. Perfect. So, hi everyone. Um, just to start off with, um, obviously Trafalgar Financial Services, we've got a financial services uh, under the group of companies. Um, I think we do get that question quite a lot, is that owners don't know that. So, just from our side, we authorize financial services and credit provider with a specialist focus on property-related entities. And that includes sectional title, body corporates, uh, HOAs, um, share blocks and also property owning entities, which encompasses trusts and uh, commercial property uh, companies in that sense as well. So that's just a brief introduction from my side. Um, just on our financing, uh, we, yeah, just to maybe touch on this, uh, these financing encompasses uh, large projects to, to uh, 
not just solar, but also do maintenance. And that's where the business started. Obviously, with solar now being a focus, we've moved into this uh, segment of the market as well. So we've got favorable terms that uh, fit the, the cash flow needs of the borrowing entity. Our interest rates are usually prime plus two. And then we charge an admin and finance fee. Um, and our finance fee is calculated on an IRR basis, which uh, from our side is risk and term dependent. So obviously we've got better clients in some sense from a financial perspective and affordability. And also then the term, obviously a longer term uh, means uh, more risk for us as a finance provider. So just touching on our on loan benefits, uh, obviously there's upfront finance for solar projects. Um, given the current stance in South Africa, I mean, it's, it's yeah, some people can't live without electricity. And also knowing that since COVID has happened, a lot of uh, owners in body corporates work from their homes. So it's becoming not more or less a luxury, but it's coming, becoming more necessity for a lot of owners in South Africa. As I said, uh, Taylor made terms to fit cash flow needs of body corporates. Um, immediate enhancement of value, which means you do the solar project today, it's finance, the whole value gets added to the body corporate, the, the properties encompassed with that. And obviously, from that perspective, it adds value to the owner's lives and also common property security and all of that. Um, great opportunity to uh, market and resell units. Again, uh, a body corporate HOA that has this in, in place. Um, from a security perspective is better. Um, we've heard of incidents where there's load shedding and uh, the common property lights are off and accidents do happen. So from that perspective, it's also a big factor. Um, one of the main issues, and I get, we talk about this a lot in this type of projects as well. We see body corporates do have residual funds um, or let's say a cash buffer in savings. Um, what we've seen in the past is, is that a body corporate HOA companies, uh, all of those would deal with a type of project and use all of their cash um, to, to do these type of project and not have sufficient savings left for emergencies and unforeseen events. So in solar spe specifically, because um, this can be financed over a very long term, um, body corporates, HOAs, property entities can use some of their cash. Obviously, your own cash is the cheapest cash opposed to financing, but it is important to have a cash buffer available um, for unforeseen emergency type of maintenance. I can't stress that enough, Then it's very important. Um, and I think I've touched on it, obviously, in the enhancement of lifestyle for homeowners, security biometric, common property. And I think I'll touch on an example a bit later. We've seen body corporates and entities going for a full solar solution. Um, but I'll touch on that a bit later, just explaining exactly how that works as well. Okay, Kareem. So just maybe from a practical uh, perspective, obviously this slide, we can share this. Just for us, from a vetting perspective as a financial services, uh, looking at body corporates and homeowners asso associations, uh, we would require three months uh, management accounts, latest annual financial statements, and obviously uh, that your managing agent is a normal member. Obviously for Trafalgar clients, which I think is the bulk of today, we can obtain all of that information with permission. Um, and then usually that takes out a lot of, a lot of admin uh, for the specific trustees or anyone uh, if we need to obtain information. And then obviously the quote of the installation to be done. Um, for a company trust, uh, specifically a company, we need the CIPC documents. Uh, for trust, we need the trustees and endorsement certificate, latest apps, three months management accounts, bank statements, bank confirmation letter, and uh, specifically for companies and trust that own properties, the property rent role as well for the affordability and feasibility assessment. And then again, obviously the quote installation to be done, and that runs through me um, and my colleagues, and then we do a feasibility assessment for uh, the clients. Thanks, Karim. Um, so, I mean, I put this slide in just to explain to some owners, just the approval process on body corporates. I think uh, Karin did touch on it uh, specifically on approval on common property. So just for financing as a whole, uh, we would issue a loan quote with a special levy schedule uh, over the various repayment terms. 
um, that's very important for owners to understand exactly what they can afford and, and can afford. So that comes down to different repayment terms and then splitting the repayment with all fees included per owner, uh, yeah, sorry, per unit per PQ, which is important then for each owner to understand exactly what they're in for and make informed decision at your AGM, SGM to understand what your owners can afford. Um, so obviously this loan quote and special levy schedule is added to your AGM and SGM uh, agenda. The project and finance needs to be approved at the AGM, SGM with a special resolution. Um, the quorum needs to be reached um, and then passed by 75% of the members present. So that's very important to understand as well. It can also be done by a round robin uh, by 75% approval of the members within reasonable time. Then typically the process runs over. Once we receive the signed minutes and special resolution, we can draw up the loan agreement. And once the agreement is signed and we receive the original copy, we can uh, process the payment of the funds either to the body corporate or directly to the service provider. And I think it's just important to note here, we would like to vet the, the service provider. And I think it was explained now earlier as well. It's extremely important that a qualified solar provider does the installation given the quantums involved. Okay, next, Curry. Okay, so this is just a typical example. And I think it's quite, uh, there was a lot of questions on the Q&A specifically on examples. Um, this is an example of a body corporate that we're busy with now. Um, just to maybe explain just quickly what the figures are you seeing. Uh, currently, what uh, the tariff per kilowatt is 2.50 uh, in this particular area. They've got a backup generator, um, and this is the cost calculated for the uh, generator um, delivering a kilowatt, and then that runs down to the project in this instance is 3.8 million. Um, that's XFAT and obviously inclusive of that 4.4 million. Just to pause here, this is a very large project for a body corporate that intends to service their uh, owners directly, and then I think Ed has more knowledge on this, which I think um, he can explain afterwards if uh, um, we have enough time, is that there is smart metering included in a lot of these uh, proposals that bills the owners for their uses directly. So um, just in this practical example, um, for year one specifically, the kilowatt savings on uh, installing a full solar system with batteries that means you're eliminating your, your use for a generator as a whole, um, comes down to 871,399 rand. So that's just the savings on the kilowatt um, for your, your normal ESCOM tariffs, and then obviously your diesel as well. And then going over to the schedule, I think the question was on the, um, specifically on the 12B of the Tax Income Act. From January, I think the first 2016, the act provided the acceleration depreciation allowance, which was previously 50, 30, 20 to 100% now on year one. So what that basically entails is that owners can, or not owners, specifically body corporate companies in that sense um, can use that incentive. And that obviously plows back into your cash flow and the return on investment of solar. So in this example, for instance, the cash outlay is marked as 3.8 million. The tax benefit in year one was 1.47 million. And then going down to the savings, the cash inflow already starts from year one. So for over a 10 year term, and specifically on Trafalgar Financial Services, we offer this finance over a 10 year term for body corporates, companies, and these, and so on. So if you, if you look at the whole a uh, picture of solar and batteries as a whole, it does make sense on a cash flow perspective over a 10 year term. So in this example, uh, we just costed it at a 10 year term and that repayment on the 4.46 million would be 73,000 and that's 883,000 a year. So just going down to the cash flow analysis you guys see on top, and we're happy to obviously share some of this information to you guys is the fact that after year one, you're already saving 871,000. That's already it's slightly more than repayment. But from year two, three, four, using the tax incentive that's there, it's a cash flow, it's a cash flow, um, what can I say? Yeah, I'm not gonna, it's a cash flow game 
in the long term over 10 years time. So if you just look at it from an investment perspective, um, just taking into account that NASA has approved the 18.65% increase for 2022 to 2023, and then applying a normal 12% escalation on the ESCOM tariffs, which I think is very conservative. Um, we're looking at an IRR investment of 31.86%, and using the tax incentive, the return on investment from year one is 21% in this example, and 48% including the tax benefit. So I think, the, I think people's minds are shifting to what is possible. From this type of perspective on a body corporate as a whole, um, it does make sense, um, but again, it depends on the size and specifically what the owners want to achieve. If it's only common property lights and so on, it will be a much smaller type of project. But um, from a body corporate whole perspective covering the owners, it is indeed possible. And we're seeing that now flooding to the market at, a, at a quite a quick, a quick pace. Okay, Andrew, that's it from my side, if there's any questions. Christian, thank you very much indeed. I think we'll carry on with um, the insurance um, scope of, of um, the presentation and then we'll come to concluding questions altogether at the end. Perfect. All right, Blady. So if I can hand over to Blady and Blady will address for us uh, what to know about in terms of insurance of your solar equipment. Thanks, Blady. Okay. Um, so just in terms of um, body corporate or building insurance, um, it's important just, you know, as Ed said earlier, um, ensure that the roof is stable, stable um, with enough support to hold the panels. Um, it may be necessary to add extra support to the roof prior to the installation. Um, that's all done, obviously, prior to the installation with the, with the necessary um, installers who are coming to have a look, um, engineers, etc. cetera. Um, the insurers uh, will not cover any damages to the roof or consequential damages um, if the structure collapses due to the additional weight. Um, it then becomes an automatic exclusion um, because you know, all the necessary precautions were not taken in terms of ensuring the stability of the roof, the structure, um, and making sure that the, the roof can contain the, the additional weight because the panels are quite heavy. Um, just on the next slide, I'm not going to go through it because um, I know that we've got a time limit, but the slides will be available. This is just a summary of the national building uh, regulations, the same regulations um, surrounding the installation um, of solar panels um, and you know what should be followed in terms of the national building regulations, etc. Um, and it's largely because of the fact that you know when dealing with insurers and there's an insurance claim, um, you know where it comes to structures or, or anything that's been installed um, over and above you know your standard um, sort of building and it's going to affect the structure or have an impact. Um, you know they work directly according to those national building regulations. Um, and often, you know, the claim, claims are, are rejected because, you know, they say that the regulations have not been, um, you know, followed, um, items haven't been installed or built according to those regulations, and it gives cause and reason, you know, for claims to be rejected, and it does then become, um, you know, a fight. Um, you know, after, once the installation is done, and as it, it correctly said, you know, it must be done by qualified people, um, electricians, um, need to work on these installations. Um, it's, it's not just, you know, the guy from the side of the road that says that I can now do the, in, the installation of solar panels. There must be the compliance certificate must be issued, um, you know, to ensure that the installation is safe um, and, it, and that it forms with, it falls within the scope of the regular, the relevant regulation, sorry. Um, so when adding um, the panels or solar installations to the insurance, um, it's important to add, you know, to add the, the, the panels, all the equipment um, must be added to the building insurance. Uh, the insurers require the following information to be submitted. It's the electrical COC issued by the qualified solar technicians, um, breakdown of the installation, the type, size and quantity of inverters and ba uh, batteries, the make, size and number of panels, and then the confirmation of both AC and DC um, combiner boxes. Um, you know, to ensure that everything is compliant and that we don't have, you know, risky installations and that's going to, you know, end up causing a fire, um, you know, burning down the unit or the building for that matter. Can go next. Uh, yeah. So the installation can be added to the building's insurance policy under the building section of the policy, okay, 
But when it's added under the building section of the policy, the general cover extends to, you know, general perils like storm, you know, hail, wind, water, that kind of thing. Um, what might happen though is where the, the installations are expensive, they are costly, um, and there's, you know, severe damages, and there's an actual peril that happens like, you know, theft without the forcible entry and power search, you know, to the installation. Most of the insurers in the specialized sectional type of policies carry a limit of cover um, for those two particular items. So your power search limits are, are usually set at around 50,000. Um, you know, if you've got an installation and that installation has cost you half a million rand, you, you're literally going to get out, you know, 49,000 because they're still going to deduct the excess. So it's important to note that, you know, to enjoy full cover um, and where replacement is necessary and there are severe damages, um, and it has the damages have been caused due to an event like power surge, for example, or theft. I mean, you know, whilst I know Ed said that he hasn't experienced it, but unfortunately these days it seems like they could build still anything that they can get their hands on. Um, but without the forcible entry, you know, there's a limit applied. In most instances, the, uh, the general limit is about 15,000, you know, for, for theft without forcible entry. Um, and so it's important just to note that you could be underinsured if you have an installation of this nature um, and that, you know, then you end up fighting with the insurer because now they're not going to cover it and you say, well, you did add it to the policy. But there's limits, um, the policy wording very specifically, it's important to read that wording, um, you know, in, in combination with the schedule where it specifies exactly what is covered, what the limits of cover are for certain items that, that can be claimed. Um, and how and what type of exclusions are applied and how those exclusions can be applied automatically where things like the national building regulations haven't been met in the requirements. So, um, you know, it's important, you know, for people just to have a look at their policy wording in conjunction with their policy schedule, um, you know, tie the two together, you know, ask your broker to, to go through it with you um, and explain so that you understand, you know, people, um, you know, generally think, well, you know, the cover is there, I've looked at my schedule, I can see I've got cover, um, but, you know, the Bible for the insurers is literally their policy wording, that is what, what they go by, and if, if, if it says it's excluded, it's excluded. Um, you know, by specifying the installation to for the full replacement value, um, it does come at a premium, it's not cheap, um, but it is far more cost effective, I think, than, than self-insuring those installations where you find that there is a claim and there is a replacement that's needed, um, you know, or excessive uh, parts that need to be replaced, um, and you only have a limit of cover, and that means that it's going to come out of the pocket of either the trustees or the, or the unit owners. So, um, you know, just bear that in mind. It is important to note it on the policy. Um, and then, you know, the other thing is, you know, check what your insurer's requirements are. Your broker should be able to, to advise you. So, you know, check with the, the insurer. You know, they'll, they should query with the insurer to say that, you know, we've got a client, they want to do this type of installation. Here's the breakdown. What are the requirements um, in order for it to be insured um, and to make sure that, you know, the insurer is going to cover it because they've given the guidelines and the requirements that they need per their policy wording. Um, so that's important just to note that and bear that in mind, you know, the two must go hand in hand. Next screen. And that's it. So, yeah, in terms of insurance, I think it's it's important to always check with your broker or your insurer directly if you are insured directly with an insurer. Um, you know, what their requirements are um, in order to make sure that when, you, when you're adding, you know, items or improvements to your, to the, 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 the building insurance policy, um, that the standards are met. We don't, you know, you don't want to be paying a premium and then, um, you know, in the long run, when you do actually have a claim, um, that the insurer turns around and says, well, we're not actually going to cover it because you didn't conform. So I think it's important, you know, for people just to understand that um, it's not always the broker's fault or, you know, anyone's fault, um, but there is a policy wording that goes hand in hand and, and, and really should be, you know, read to understand and where there's queries or questions, you know, it's important for clients and trustees just to refer them back to get clarity. And that's me, I'm done. Anything else? All right, thanks, Bloody. Um, so we've just got a last few minutes, just a question that came up for um, insurance. So if the solar is installed on exclusive use areas, which are being created um, for the installation purpose, would that insurance still be covered on the body corporate policy, um, bearing in mind it's now on exclusive use areas? So I, I would imagine it should go on to the body corporate insurance because if there's going to be a claim on the building, the buildings in building insurance policies is, is the one that's going to entertain it. 
So I know that you know you can speci owners can specify those installations on their personal policies, um, but there is the, you know there's still some debate as to you know is it if it's a fixture, um, you know if you're going to sell the unit is that staying behind? Are you removing you know your solar installation? Are you taking it with you? Um, you know the practical part of that needs you know is obviously what needs to be considered as well. Um, but I think the first port of call is when, when there's a claim, they're going to go straight to the building insurance first. Okay. Um, Karine, can I ask you just to put up the slide with the contact details? Um, I've been trying to answer questions as best I can. Probably not going to complete it by six o'clock when we're going to conclude. So if everyone would please just take note of the contact details. If your question hasn't been answered, please would you refer it to the um, most qualified person from the panel? And I'm sure they'll be pleased to get back to you and uh, you know engage in a discussion um, as required. Um, Ed, just in the last, um, well, Karine, firstly, uh, there was a question about you know inverters and batteries can typically be located inside the unit, inside the section itself. So in that case, it would be perfectly acceptable for an owner to move ahead with the internal equipment to get you know quality of lifestyle sustainability in place. The um, ESCOM or the electricity supplier would power the, the battery by the inverter and there would be battery backup. And then panels could be added to that installation if it was scoped up front and it was a grid tied inverter. It could be added once the conduct rules or the EUA, et cetera, are achieved. So you agree with that? That would be a good first step and allow some sort of parallel process to be adopted. Yeah, Andrew, if there's nothing done on common property, if, it's, if everything is inside your unit, then what I've said before doesn't really apply because what I've been talking about is improvements to the common property. So uh, generators, inverters inside your unit will be a different story. We will just still have to make sure that the complex rules provide for standards, um, noise levels, um, you, because you can't be a nuisance to other owners, things like that will still be, will come in play. Um, but yeah, they, they, there would be no improvement to the common property then. Great. All right, last two questions I'm going to address to Ed. Um, I'd just like to say if anyone would like a copy of the slides, um, please do email Karine, Karine C at trafalgar.coza. Karine would be able to send you the slides um, if you would like those separately to the recorded webinar. And we gave you address for that at training.trafalgar.coza. Ed, last two questions and then we'll close. The first is, um, I don't know if we emphasize the structural engineer to check on the roof structure and the roof being safe to carry the, the panels. And the good question is if all the houses are similar or comparable in structure, would a structural engineer just be able to assess the one property as an indication of the others and sign off the installation on that basis? And maybe just talk a little bit about how you scope an installation, the software you use, to maximize the coverage, to make sure you've got the right, um, you know, elevation and angles, and really then sort of do a proposal based on the, you know, site assessment you spoke about. Sure, Andrew. With regards to structural engineers, it's been our experience that that homeowner or body corporates and homeowners associations do require the perspective of a structural engineer on some of the main dwellings that are common property. When it comes to the individual owners, it's generally left up to that individual owner to get the necessary registrations or uh, accreditations to meet his personal requirements. What we have found on some of the bigger body corporates who are looking to do a major installation because they own their own transformer and they wanna supply their own power, the engineer generally checks a random sample of the dwellings within that environment and then provides a certificate. With regards, yeah. Okay. All right. Very good. Well, Ed, thank you so much. So um, we have reached six o'clock, so I'd like to close up, um, at this time. So many thanks to the panelists. Thank you for your presentations. Thank you to everyone who joined us. I hope it was an informative session. You have contact details. If you have further questions or require any input or support, um, you're more than welcome to request the slides. You're more than welcome to share the um, link to the, the recorded webinar. Um, that would be great. And um, just a, a heads up, we are planning our next webinar. 
Um, we're going to run it on the third Thursday of every month. So the 23rd of March, we will be um, facilitating our next webinar, which will be on amending conduct rules, which are very, very important. Um, there are many uh, considerations of modernizing these rules from the initial rules, which might have been registered. Tonight, we've talked about exactly an example where conduct rules might need to be amended to cater for solar installations and the installation of the solar equipment. So please do join us then if it's helpful. There could well be a survey which pops up when you log out, just asking for feedback, whether you found this webinar helpful, if there's anything we can do to improve, and in particular, if there are any topics you would like us to address with one of our monthly webinars. So good night, everybody. Thank you for your time. Uh, we appreciate you attending, and I hope it was a useful session. Good night.